Thank you. Before I get started, I have a confession to make, like so many of the speakers do here. I guess when you come to a Christian church to speak, a confession doesn't seem so odd. And I'm Catholic, so you know. <laughs> and I need to get something off my chest. You see, as I was preparing to speak today, I was very nervous for this past week. And you might think that's normal, but for me, I don't generally get nervous. I feel very blessed that I like to speak. I'm passionate about this. Earlier this year, I spoke at West Point in front of a thousand cadets. It was incredible. And their families at a formal dinner in front of generals and military brass. And I wasn't really nervous. And I speak in front of corporations, and I speak in front of universities and nonprofits. And usually I don't get too anxious or nervous. But this was different. And I couldn't figure out why until I finally dawned on me that I have never in my life spoke to such an important audience because you in local churches really are doing the most important work in the world. And there is just no doubt about that. Um, and so my nervousness comes from my desire to in some way, if I could in some way help you do better in those churches, working with your people, building teams, then that's what I want to do. And that's my prayer today. Now, the other reason why I was nervous is because they told me, given the size of the audience and all the satellite sites out there, and I want to send out my shouts, as they say on MTV, I think, to my homies in uh, Walnut Creek, California, at Walnut Creek Presbyterian. Yay, Walnut Creek. <laughs> that was cool, huh? <laughs> Um, the other reason why I'm nervous is because they said I couldn't really do audience interaction. See, I'm a consultant at heart, and I like to ask questions of the audience and have them ask me. I like to get distracted. Anybody here done the Myers-Briggs? Show of hands here in South Barrington. Yeah, okay. So I'm an ENFP. Any ENFPs yes. out there? Yes. Wow. So the prayer of the ENFP is, Dear Lord, please help me to focus more on... Oh, look, a bird. On... <laughs> The things. And that is totally me. So because I don't have any audience interaction, I have to stick to my script and present this linearly, and, and it's going to be tough for me. So you, here's a free book. If you could throw that at me if I drift too far, <laughs> chuck it at me, because I'm going to drift. <laughs> so I'm kind of nervous about having to do that. Um, I have to admit, I'm a little nervous, too, that in front of 36,000 Christians, I'm going to use a curse word once. And so, <laughs> here, you throw a book at me if I do that, okay? <laughs> All right. So now that I've gotten that off my chest, let's get started. Teamwork. Someone said something funny, share that with me. <laughs> what I'm going to talk to you about today is about leadership and leading teams. And while leadership is so important that we can lead large congregations and nations if we're presidents like Karen was talking about, but what I'm really going to talk to you about is leadership in the context of those people that report to you, the people that are on your team. Because that, to me, is so much of what leadership is about. You know, I talk to CEOs sometimes, like, yeah, I like leading, I like giving speeches. I don't really like to work, manage my team, though. I think they should do that themselves. And I just think if we abdicate that, I mean, if George Bush does not manage his cabinet and his staff, he's done, no matter what kind of a speaker he is. And so what I want to talk to you today is how to build teams and how to be leaders of your staff teams, OK? Now. The first dysfunction of a team, let's just dive right into it, is the absence of trust. And you can turn in your booklet into page, I don't know what page, <laughs> six, thank you very much. Oh, 26, even better, 26. <laughs> yeah, thank you. See, I can interact with the audience. Page 26 in your book, the absence of trust. Now, when you first hear about this, that's the first dysfunction of a team, you might say, no, duh. You know, like the absence of trust. And, and also you might think, ooh, this guy's from California and my office is dangerously close to Berkeley. And so like, oh, we're going to talk about trust. We're going to hold hands and get naked and sing songs. All right. You know? 
<laughs> oh yeah, somebody's like, yeah, get excited. Michigan, it's Michigan over there. You know? <laughs> yeah, Michigan. <laughs> But what I'm talking about when I talk about trust is something very specific and, specific and very practical, and that is vulnerability-based trust. As leaders of teams, we have to generate trust on our teams by helping people get comfortable being vulnerable with one another. That means people on a team have to say they're sorry, I was wrong, I made a mistake, I'm bad at that, I need your help, you're better than I am at that, I admire you. They have to be human and real and vulnerable. And yet as leaders, we're certainly not taught this. I mean, you know, it's like, don't let them see you sweat, you know? And as pastors, I can only imagine these people are looking up to you, not only for guidance and management, which is part of your job, but for spiritual guidance. And the thought of being vulnerable in front of them is pretty daunting. You know, I once worked with an executive team that had a vulnerability issue. Not at the leadership level in this case. But they had one person on their team. And they, this was an amazing company that had this all-star group of executives. They had lots of funding, a great product. Really everything in the world going for them. But they had this one executive on the team who just couldn't seem to get that. And one, one night at a dinner between off-site days, at a two-day off-site, they had some wine, which is, of course, the great elixir of truth sometimes. <laughs> And she picked up her glass after a few of them and said, let me tell you guys something. We've been talking about trust, but I've been married to my husband for 10 years, and I've barely learned to trust him, so I'm not going to be trusting you guys anytime soon, if ever. <laughs> and we were like, oh, you know, <laughs> OK. So the CEO and I, she and I stepped outside after the dinner and said, this is the problem. This is the issue, because if just one member of the team has, a trouble, has trouble with trust. It really hurts the entire team because we would go to their offsite meetings and I would be a facilitator. And whenever we'd be getting into an issue, this one person would speak and whatever she said, people learned not to comment on it at all. The conversation would grind to a halt. It would be uncomfortable until somebody changed the subject and they moved on. Because they realized if they ever commented on anything she said, all that she was going to do is defend her position there was no use challenging her or even putting out another point. Because one member of a team can hurt the, the dynamics that much. Now, I want to be very careful here, especially in this environment. This CEO didn't go out and say, all right, you're fired. You know, I don't think you should go to your management team and go, yeah, trusting, trusting, not trusting, bye-bye, trusting, not trusting, trusting. Because we have to work with people to help them understand the importance of this. But ultimately, after months of working with this person and trying to get her to open up and be more vulnerable, she couldn't do it. She had to manage her out. You saw that conversation. We talk, we're going to talk more about that in a little bit. The next off-site meeting I attended with that team after she had gone, it was amazing to watch the dynamics. They, they got into issues. They made faster decisions. They made better decisions. People didn't hold back purely because they had one member of the team who previously couldn't trust who was gone. It was like watching a whole new company. This is so critical in our organizations. And yet, the leader has to go first. Oh, let's go back. We went ahead too far. Can we go back to the previous slide? You jumped ahead of me there. OK, we're not. We're talking about the role of the leader is to be vulnerable. The role of the leader is to be vulnerable. Oh, you're not even looking at that, are you? <laughs> Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Thank you, guys. <laughs> All right. Oh, look, a bird. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, Willow Creek. Here we go. Um, so, the, the role of the leader is to be vulnerable first, though. The leader has to set the stage by being vulnerable and open first. I once worked with the CEO of a company, a famous company that you've probably heard of this guy. The company struggled and didn't succeed. He moved on. He's someplace else now. And he, but he really hurt the, 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 the organization by not being vulnerable. And here's the, the story I tell that kind of demonstrates that. I heard years later about this. He went to Asia on a conference, to a conference on economic development. He took with him his chief information officer. And this woman, this chief information officer, she had a master's degree in economic theory. 
She was fascinated by economics, and the conference was about economics. So she went to this conference to go to the sessions and to really take part in it. She thought it was very interesting. He was a technology guy, and he went to give a speech, and it was a marketing thing, kind of a boondoggle. And he didn't really get into the conference. On the way back to the airport, they got in the taxi cab, and she started to explain to him what was going on in Asia from a macroeconomic standpoint. And he interrupted her and said, no, no, that's not it. This is what's going on. And he started to lecture her. And she told me later in confidence, she said, Pat, that's the day I realized I could never be smarter than him at anything because he was the CEO. And so many leaders, the question I have to ask you is, can your people be smarter than you? Can they be better than you? Can they have skills that you can look them in the face and say, I admire that in you. I want to be more like you in that way. And it can't be like, gee, I'm glad you're good at accounting because I, I hate doing that, you know. It's got to be something that you really admire, you know. <laughs> and as leaders, we have to understand the power of that because people will follow a leader into a fire if they're human and they're honest and they're vulnerable. But, huge but here, you can't fake it. Do not fake it. You know, I give this speech a lot, and the CEO's like, yes, I will go back to work and be vulnerable on Monday. Yes. Maybe I'll even cry. You know? And it's like, no, 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 no. It's better to be humanly, to struggle with it, than it is to fake it, because if you fake it, you always get caught, ultimately, and then you lose your credibility. And I don't have to talk to you. You know, there's so many public examples of that in politics and, and you know, in televangelism. And then people go, oh, I don't think they're really, truly sorry. Or I don't think it's, they really think it's a weakness. So this is one, do not fake it. If it's not painful in the moment to do it, it's not real. It's that moment when you say something during a meeting and you go, oh, I think I was way out of line. I don't want to say that. That's that level five moment, as Jim Collins talked about, where you say, I screwed up. I am sorry. You know? Trust is based on vulnerability. We as human beings don't trust people that can't be vulnerable. But why is trust so important? Because let's just all trust one another. Well, trust isn't in itself a good thing. But the reason why trust is so important, let's put that slide up there or go to the slide in your book. Because without an absence, if without trust, we are prey to the next dysfunction of a team. And that is we will have a fear of conflict in our organizations. We will have a fear of conflict in our organizations if there's not trust. Because why in the world will a, would a person engage in unfiltered, passionate conflict with someone if they didn't trust them? I don't think you should, because you might very well get burned. Trust is critical for a very pragmatic, practical reason, because that's the only way you get your people to weigh in with one another. Now, I'm talking about constructive, ideological conflict here. The debate, passionate debate over issues, not, not personal issues. You know, when I speak to audiences like this, I often say, so what kind of organizations do you think have the, the worst, ugly, mean-spirited, the bad kind of conflict? And people say the answer that I was always looking for, like nonprofits often do, and, and universities. And lately, I've gotten a lot of people saying, I think churches sometimes struggle with this. And it's like, really? And the reason why is because churches hire people who are not very nice. So, what we have to do, no, that's not it at all, of course it's not it. Nonprofits don't hire people that are like meanness and either do universities or, or, or churches. It's because so many times when that issue of conflict comes up, we think, I can't disagree, I can't passionately debate with this person, I can't make them uncomfortable because they're a volunteer or we're doing the Lord's work or we're enlightening young people's minds. So I should just let that go, and I'll just agree to disagree in my own heart. I won't say anything to them. I won't make it uncomfortable. But when you do that, suddenly there's this dissatisfaction that's fermenting in your soul, and eventually it comes out in a really unproductive way. Like, you go to a meeting, and you smile, and you nod. A guy's given a presentation. You don't think it's very smart, but you don't tell him it's not good. And then you leave, and you go, that guy's really stupid. <laughs> How much better is it to say, I think that's not a good idea? And in these organizations where we're here to do great work, conflict is actually critical. Okay? And certainly, Christ did not avoid conflict in his life. He didn't seek it to humiliate people, but he didn't try to placate everyone. 
And just like this conversation that we saw here today, like we need to be having that conflict up front. Now, culturally, though, this looks very different from one organization to another, from one culture to another. You know, if you were to go to Japan and you were to go to a meeting and you were to promote, propose an idea that the, that the Japanese members of the team just hated, do you know what they would say? They'd go like this. They suck through their teeth. That's a good sign. <laughs> Hi. Yes. Yes. Could be a problem, but yes. Which is why Americans come back and go, oh, I think we got a deal. <laughs> a couple details. And of course, there's no chance at all. Of course, you go to Italy and you agree on everything but the color of the font on the contract, and they're giving you one of those. You know, they're like, yeah, and they're screaming and shouting. And because in Italy, you disagree on a little thing and you're screaming. In Japan, you don't say no. Even here in the United States, I love working with people on the East Coast. You know, and I saw a cartoon years ago, which I'll have to edit um, for today. And that showed, <laughs> what? <laughs> a guy in, in Los Angeles on the street in the first frame of the cartoon, and he said, good morning. But the bubble said, you know, heck with you, so to speak. And then it showed the guy in New York that said, heck with you. And the bubble said, good morning. <laughs> you know? And so every church represented here, every organization here, you have a different culture of conflict. It might be because of the location, because you might be in Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> or somewhere else. <laughs> Yay, everybody else. Or Walnut Creek. Oh, they're not here. OK. But you've got, you've got to understand your culture. The key is not that you're Italian about it, or Japanese about it, or New York, or LA. The key is this. Are people on your team holding back? Are people choosing their battles? People shouldn't choose their battles on a team. If the first three things that somebody says you disagree with, you should explain that. Choosing your battles is for political situations, not for teams, not for teams. Now, there's something else I should say. You know, I'm Italian and Irish, so I mean, no matter how hard I try, conflict is just in my blood. <laughs> and, uh, so my team, we have dysfunctions ourselves back at work at my company, but this is one that we're decent at. Like, we'll go to a restaurant, and we'll get into a business topic at, at, at lunch, and I'm pretty oblivious, as I explained before, about what's going on around, you know, but we'll get into this business topic, and evidently we'll get very fired up about it because that's how I am, but it's just about the topic. And then after the, the lunch, we'll be leaving, and one of my staff members will say, did you see those people sitting behind us? I'm like, no, why? Oh, they were looking at us. They thought we were going to, like, come to blows. And it's like, really? And it's like, because a good team looks funky to people on the outside. It's like, wow, they're wacky. It's like, no, they just know each other well enough to disagree and to be passionate without there being any residual damage. So if your team doesn't look wacky, there's something wrong. <laughs> the last thing I want to say about conflict, the last thing I want to say about conflict, yeah, your team will be fine then. You guys will be just fine. <laughs> um, the last thing I want to say about conflict is this. The most important place where conflict has to occur is in meetings. Now, so many of the executives I work with, I'm writing a book about this right now, so many of the executives I work with say, gee, if I didn't have to go to meetings or manage people, I'd really like my job. <laughs> and to me, that's like rolling into surgery and having the, the surgeon turn to the nurse and say, gee, if I didn't have to operate on all these people, this would be awesome. <laughs> Can you imagine? If I didn't have to preach and do service, oh, this pastor gig would be great. <laughs> When you're a manager, and that's the thing, you're pastors, but you're managers as well, and leaders. Going to meetings is what we do. And the problem isn't that we go to too many meetings, it's that we go to too many bad meetings. Okay? One of the reasons, I, I, I missed that comment, and it was a good one. Um, I missed another one. Oh my God, it's got out of control! Okay, you've been a great crowd. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, meetings. I used to be a screenwriter for fun after I got out of college at night. I just did it for fun. And one of the things I learned in screenwriting is something I've applied to meetings. And that is what makes a great movie or a great screenplay is conflict. The, at the heart of every story, whether it's an, you know, a, a foreign film that's very sophisticated or an action movie or a lighthearted romantic comedy, every great movie has conflict at its core, something that you care about. 
It's interesting. You're anxious about how it's going to get resolved. And, and, you know, we learned this in junior high. It's man versus man or woman versus woman, man versus nature, or very often man versus himself or woman versus herself. There's some fundamental tension and conflict that we care about, which is why we don't turn the channel or leave the theater. We're interested. And think about it this way. If I said to you, hey, would you rather go to a movie or a meeting? You'd say, what are you, drunk? I'd rather go to a, mo a movie. And yet I actually think meetings should be more interesting than movies. Because they're about two hours. Think about it. Your average staff meeting might be two hours in length, right? A movie's about two hours. And yet a movie is completely passive. There's no interactive nature to it. And it's irrelevant to your life. I mean, if the hero wins or not, you still got to go to work the next day or you got to do your thing. But a meeting is, one, it's interactive. You get to actually interrupt people and say, hey, what about this? And more importantly, it's relevant. At the end of the meeting, probably you're going to have to do something different as a result of what was decided. So movies are passive and irrelevant. Meetings are interactive and relevant, and we hate meetings. And that's because we kill the conflict. Our meetings should be passionate, interesting, anxiety-laden, and they should matter. And now, do you know the point, the most important part of a meeting? What's the most important part of a movie? If it's two hours in length, what's the most important section of that movie? The end. Who said that? How many people said the end? You're all wrong. <laughs> but I used to think it was the end, too. What's the most important part? The beginning. I'll just pretend that everybody who said something said, yes, the beginning. The first 10 minutes of a movie. If you're writing a script, it's the first 10 pages. Because the reader and the viewer, in the first 10 pages, they decide whether or not they like it for the first 10 minutes of the movie. After that, you interpret it in light of your first response. It's like, well, this is really boring. This scene is pretty good, but it's a bad movie. Or if you like the first scene, you'll go, later on it can, it can drag and you go, well, it's kind of boring now, but this is an awesome movie. The first 10 minutes of your meetings, ladies and gentlemen, have to be great. If you're a leader of a meeting or a manager, Ask yourself, am I scripting these meetings? And I don't mean in a manipulative way. Am I drawing out the, what's interesting at this meeting? So let me give you the example of the most boring meeting I could ever imagine, a budget review. Now, my apologies to all my financial friends out there. But I mean, OK, we're going to review the budget. Now, here's how they usually begin. Ladies and gentlemen, turn to page 48 in your books, uh, last year's budget books. Uh, Fred, could you read down the left-hand column and compare the numbers to this year's numbers? And you're saying, oh, god. You're like. I wonder what these people look like in their underwear. Oh, you, know? you do it. You know you're doing it. <laughs> and people are gone. The rest of the movie is, is terrible. So how would you make that interesting? Well, how about this? How about, OK, everybody, I know we got to spend 90 minutes on this budget. It could be tedious. But I want you to think about this. Our competitors, and in your case it might not be that, but for business, our competitors would love us to get these numbers wrong. Our employees are counting on us to get it right because their jobs depend on us allocating these resources correctly. And you know something? If we fail to pay attention today because we're bored, nine months from now we're going to be sitting in our office cursing ourselves for, make, for getting it wrong. We're going to lose the credibility of our staff, and we're going to make it easier for our competitors to hurt us. So why don't we all sit on the edge of our seats and pay attention for the next 90 minutes because we have to live with these decisions for a year. Not an Academy Award, but a little better than turn to page 42 in your budget booklets. Meetings aren't bad. We as leaders need to be better at them. And it's about conflict. It's about conflict. OK. Why is conflict so important? Because I'm Italian and Irish, and it's just fun. No. <laughs> conflict is important because it enables us to avoid the next dysfunction of a team. And the next dysfunction of a team is the lack of commitment. You see, if people don't have conflict at meetings, if they don't passionately debate a decision and weigh in, they're not going to really commit. They might nod their head at the end. They might acquiesce. But six months later, they're going to come back to a meeting, and the lead, you're as a leader going to say, didn't we already decide this? And they're going to go, well, yeah, but I was never really on board. We have to get good at getting our people to have conflict so that at the end of that meeting, when we have to commit to something, we know it's not a passive commitment, it's an active one. Because you know something? Human beings are immensely reasonable. Of course, we knew that when we were employees, but now that we're in leadership roles, it's like, these people are unreasonable. But the truth is, and I see this all the time, if you can get your team to stand on their seat at some point during a meeting and weigh in on an issue, 
and you can genuinely consider that. At the end of that meeting, when you have to make a decision and break a tie because there's not a natural consensus, and there's almost never a natural consensus, even if they disagreed with you, if you can explain your reason and you, you can have heard them and consider their input, 19 and a half times out of 20, they're gonna go right along with the decision because human beings do not have an innate need to have their way. They have an innate need to have their way considered and factored into a decision. And by not having conflict, we are begging them to commit passively and to re-raise those issues over and over again. So I encourage you to help people, and we're gonna talk about this in a little bit, where you're gonna do a little self-assessment in a few minutes. And we're gonna talk about how to get people to do this. But conflict is important precisely because of commitment. It's just critical. You know, and here's a common example. It's very administrative, but it's interesting. So I was working with an international pharmaceutical company. Actually, oh, I won't say where it's based. You'll figure it out. Anyway, so, um, oh, that darn bird is back. Um, <laughs> So, they, yeah, they, the, the CEO decided, <laughs> you're not doing a very good job with the book. <laughs> the CEO decided that uh, they couldn't fly business class anymore when they traveled, which was a big thing for them because they were always traveling business class and they were traveling a lot. So, and everybody in the meeting just said, okay. Nobody argued with the CEO. Nobody said, are you kidding? That's going to demoralize people. Well, half of the team went out and told their staffs no more business class travel, and they took the brunt of it, and there was a lot of flack, but they held it, and they said, it's the right thing to do for the company. The other half of the executives went out and said, forget it, just do it, whatever you want, I'll approve it. So people were like getting on airplanes together from different departments, one going to the front and one going back to my seat in the, by the bathroom on American, you know, and it's like, what are you doing? Well, I, my boss told me I could do that. Well, my boss, I mean, think about the credibility loss on just an issue like that. How often do we fail to get real commitment from people? Now, before I go on, I want to say something about, a lot of people ask me how gender affects leadership in teams, you know. Anybody here read the book Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus? Yeah. I've never read it, but I've had parts of it read to me out loud. Um, <laughs> my wife is here. My wife is here. <laughs> Anyway, I have had the opportunity, I think because I, work in, I did a lot of work in high tech when I started my career, and I've, in my career I've had eight bosses that were men and eight that were women. And I've worked with a lot of female executive teams in my offices, we have good, a lot more females than males actually. And um, I can tell you this, gender is so far down on the list of differentiators if it's even on the list. I do not see a truly gender specific difference between ma male leaders, female leaders, male team members, female team members. Oh. Well, I could have said women were better. <laughs> you know, you know. But I think it's, it's one of those things that we sometimes get distracted with. Like, but isn't it different when you work for this? And you know, I'm looking for it because it would be interesting to tell you during a speech, here's what I've found, and I don't think it's there. So for whatever that's worth, I just kind of want to lay that to rest. Um, all right, why is co commitment so important? Why is it so important to get people to fundamentally commit to something? It's because if we do not, the next dysfunction of a team becomes a problem. And that is, there's an avoidance of accountability on the team. And when I talk about accountability, I'm talking about peer-to-peer -peer accountability, not leader-to-team accountability. The best form of accountability you have, sir, where are you going? Anybody else feel free to get up, you know. <laughs> the best form of accountability we have on our teams is peer-to-peer -peer accountability. When peer pressure is powerful, and when you have a, when you have a team at your church, and people, they, they do the right thing precisely because the thought of letting down their peers is so distasteful, that is one of the most positive things you can have in your organization. Ironically, ironically, it's the leaders that are uncomfortable holding people accountable, who don't do it, who get called on to do it by their team. You see, if, if I'm a leader of a team, and I'm very holding people accountable, I, I enter to the danger and I do that, people will realize, well, he's going to do it anyway, I might as well tell him. 
and so they'll do it peer to peer. You know, years ago, the 49ers uh, traded for a player from another team, and this is when the 49ers were a great team, and, um, and Bill Walsh was the coach, and you know those years, and, and they had this amazing culture of teamwork and, and commitment to the organization. And so they traded for a player from another team, and at his first practice, he sprained his ankle, so he couldn't suit up for his first game, and he didn't even show up. He wasn't on the sidelines. And the other player, everybody noticed it, but the general manager didn't talk to him, and the coach didn't talk to him, and the owner didn't talk to him, the players went to him and said, listen, if you do that again, we will make sure you're gone. And that, to me, is very efficient and very effective. Now, they all knew that ultimately Bill Walsh or the general manager would do it for them if they had to. But it's so much better if team members can turn to one another, and it's not usually punitive like that, and just say, listen, I think you can do better. Or, what's going on in your area? We have to get peers to hold each other accountable. But again, as I say, the leader has to be willing to do it first. And let me tell you this, this is my temptation as a leader. I do not like to hold people accountable. It is, I'm a wuss. Okay? That's not a curse word, is it? <laughs> Gotta check the approved list of, well, no, it's not. <laughs> Only halfway to go, I'm almost there. <laughs> um, so, I don't like to hold people accountable. I don't like to hold people accountable. And you know something, among the senior executives I work with, I'd be curious to know what, how Bill is about this. But among the senior executives I work with, this is the hardest one for them. The higher you go up in a company, I find that the more reticence there is to hold people accountable. On the exterior, they look like they're accountable, you know, but they really don't like to do it because the people you have to hold accountable are your peers. Really? I mean, these are people, Bill has to hold Jimmy accountable. Jimmy sits down the hall from him. They're buddies, they're friends, they admire and respect each other. It's one thing to think about, well, that person's 20 years my junior and they're just out of college. Yeah, I guess I can tell them what to do. But to tell someone who's your age or general socioeconomic status or whatever it is, that they're not doing something right is hard. A couple stories to illustrate this. Um, I once worked with an executive, a famous executive again, who was the CEO of a company and the president and chief operating officer too. He had all those titles. And he was frankly tired of being the president and chief operating officer because he liked strategy and vision and liked to give talks and marketing. He didn't want to be involved in the day-to-day -day operations, so he said, I'm going to hire a chief operating officer and a president. So after a while, he was looking for this person. One of his, his direct reports, who I will call Fred, who was not very well liked by his peers, Fred started to tell everyone on the team, I'm going to be the next president. So people were pretty upset about this and concerned. And finally, one brave soul went to this famous CEO and said, excuse me, uh, I have a question. Is Fred going to be the next president? And the CEO said, no, 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 no. He said, OK, second question. Did you know he was telling everybody that? The CEO said, I had no idea. Third question, one more. Are you going to tell him to stop? And this is what he said verbatim, and I hear this all the time from CEOs. Oh, I don't have the time and the energy for that. You know, I got a lot on my plate. I don't have the time and the energy to deal with stuff like that. I don't know about you, but hey, Fred, yeah, it's a CEO. No, you're not going to be the next president. Yeah, you're kind of ticking me off that you're telling everybody that. Something bad's going to happen to you if you don't stop, buddy. Yeah, have a good day. Bye bye. <laughs> what was that, like eight seconds? <laughs> kind of energizing, in fact. You know, he's, not, he's tired. <laughs> but they don't do that. Well, you know, Here, here's one that happened to me years ago. I was working in an organization. I was reporting to the CEO of a company. I was in charge of leadership development and communication, and I had my annual budget review with the CFO. And for those CFOs are out here, and I know I've met a few of you, um, he, this guy was your prototypical curmudgeon CFO, not like you guys. <laughs> and so, but anyway, so I went into his, to the meeting. He was a very outspoken guy. He said to me right off the bat, he said, Pat, before we get started, I just want to tell you, if it were up to me, I'd fire you and your entire staff and put the savings to the bottom line because I think the work you do is silly. So it was a California company, so I thanked him for sharing. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> and then I said, Fred, they're always named Fred, apologies to Fred's out there. I said, Fred, this is a problem. You've got to talk to the CEO about this because these are his programs. And for you, the second or third most influential person in the company to be publicly deriding them and, and criticizing them is like flushing our money down the drain. You should talk to him about this and have this out. He said, I'm not going to talk to him. I said, OK, then I am. He goes, fine. Next day, knocked on the CEO's door. I said, Mark, I talked with Fred yesterday, and he thinks all this stuff I'm doing for you is stupid. And he goes, oh, that's just Fred. 
I said, no, 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 no. This is a problem, you know, because he's pretty outspoken about it, and you guys really need to work this out. I mean, they set this, 5,000-person company, they sat next door to each other, this much plaster and wood. All you had to do was walk around there and talk to him. He said, you know, Pat, I don't have that kind of time and energy, essentially. I got Wall Street to worry about. I got bigger things on my plate. What do you notice about both of those examples? It wasn't holding people accountable for their numbers. I mean, even though the slightly wussy CEOs will do that, I mean, you know, it's like the numbers are the numbers. It's holding people accountable for their behaviors. Oh, we don't like to do that. In fact, I would say that most of the leaders I work with would rather wait till somebody's numbers fail so they can do it in a quantitative fashion, I don't know what's wrong, I just see your numbers are going bad, than actually enter the danger with them ahead of time and say, the way you're treating your people, it's not gonna work. Or I've noticed the way you're organizing your work, ah, you're gonna fail. As leaders, we have to have the courage, the courage to enter the danger with people. This skit right over here, which, oh my goodness, I read the script for this ahead of time, they sent it to me, I was like, man, these people are talented. And then I watched it, and I was getting tears in my eyes, and I thought, there's so much truth in that skit. And I love that line when he says, why didn't you tell me? And he says, well, it would have been hard. And he says, and this is easy? You know, it's like that Fram oil filter commercial, you know? You can pay me now or pay me later. It's a lot more expensive later. And yet it's human. I mean, I hate this. I do not like to do it. And I'll talk to you about how to overcome that maybe a little bit in a little bit. Now, a lot of people ask me, if you look at the model, what's the difference between conflict and accountability? Aren't they the kind of the same, though? You know, like, if you're willing to have conflict with people, aren't you willing to hold them accountable? And not necessarily. Because, see, I'm the Italian-Irish father here. I'm very comfortable. Some, I have twin boys that are five years old. Um, and, and, oh, my, I miss them. So, uh, <laughs> damn. Thank you. Thank you. See, the guy with the, give your book to him. Give your book to him. <laughs> so someday, and I'm, I'm dreading this day, like 11 years from now, they're going to be driving, because they're five years old, and they're going to come home from a date at 10.30, and the curfew is going to be 10 o'clock. And I'm going to, and <laughs> and I'm going to meet them at the door, and we're going to have it out, because that's how I am. Where have you been? Did you hear 10 o'clock? What do you think? You're just ignoring me? And they're going to say, Dad, it's unfair, blah, blah, all this stuff, and we'll have it out. And then at the, so we'll have the conflict. And then at the end, they're going to say, so am I grounded? And I'll go, nah, get out of here. <laughs> and I know what you're thinking, buddy, you're in for a long life. <laughs> because i got to fix this. But that's the thing. I don't like to hold people accountable. I don't like to say, that's got to stop. I don't mind having a theoretical conversation with them and getting passionate, but when I have to draw the line and say, you can't do that anymore, and this is the consequences, I don't like it. I don't like it. It's hard. Okay, why is it so important to hold people accountable? Because without it, we fall prey to the ultimate dysfunction of a team, which is inattention to results. And you might think, well, if you're not paying attention to results, then what are you paying attention to? God bless you. Well, you have... <laughs> Hey, where is everybody? Anyway, it's a Christian conference. <laughs> the guy sneezed. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um. People will pay attention to other things besides results if you're not holding them accountable. What they're going to pay attention to is their own career development, their own personal interests, and here's a tr tricky one, their own departments. You know, I, once, I worked with Los Altos Baptist Church in California. Hello there, everybody. And anyway, so they came to one of my team sessions, and it was interesting. They were talking about, well, this guy's in charge of the school. This guy's in charge of outreach. This guy's in charge of team worship. This guy's in charge of services. This guy's the financial guy. And, and, and it's, the, the question I asked for them is, what's your number one team? Is it this team or is it the one you lead? Because if you think about it, the team you lead, you probably hired them. You got to pick them. You spent a lot of time with them. You're very loyal to them. They're loyal to you. And so, so many of the executives I work with 
I say, is it the results of this collective team at the top of the organization? Is that team number one? Or is team number one the one that you're the papa bear or mama bear of back in your department? This is such a critical issue to struggle with. An organization that is infected with teamwork in the right way has to make the team at the top number one and has to cascade from there. Otherwise, people are going to come and be like at the United Nations and they're going to argue or, or, or lobby for their own interests. So even though you think, but I'm loyal to these people and the people in the school are my first responsibility. No, the first responsibility is the team that you're a member of. You know what the advantage of being Bill Hybels or other than getting to sail a lot and um, being Bill or the leader of an organization at the very top is that your number one team is actually the same as the team you lead. Everyone else, though, has to prioritize being a member of a team ahead of being a leader of a team. And that is tough. That is tough. Um, Scotty Pippen is coming back to Chicago. Am I right? Right, right, right. Years ago, when Michael Jordan retired the first of three times, <laughs> what people often don't realize in retrospect was that the Bulls were still probably the best team in the NBA, right? I mean, and I don't want to go through the players. I could, but I'm not going to. But they have this amazing group of players. Pippen was now their leader and their star. And they had Phil Jackson as a coach and everything else. Well, at one point in the playoffs that year, you remember this, they were playing the Knicks, and I think there was 10 seconds left to go in the game, and they were tied. Phil Jackson, the coach, called the team over, Pippen, the leader, and all the players, and said, here's the play, and designed a play. And the ball was going to actually go to Tony Kukoc to take the last shot. You remember what did Pippen do? Sat on the bench, refused to go on the court. You know, and the announcers were like, did he foul out? They were looking at their sheet. Did he get hurt? I didn't see him get hurt. No, he sat out. He said, if I don't get to take the last shot, then I'm not going out there. And you know, what a beautiful thing for him to do. I wish every executive team I worked with had the audacity for a person on the team to say, hey, it's not about the team, it's about me. <laughs> I mean, it was so clear. I mean, it's like most times they hide it. But he was like, no, really, I don't want to play. I don't care if we win. I mean, it's about me. Kukoc made the shot, and they won the game, but that's irrelevant. The point is, the point is we have to ask ourselves on our teams, is it about the results we're trying to achieve, or is it about how we feel about ourselves or how our own career is developing? And you know something? It's always the bottom line, folks. The beauty is in a church, the bottom line is whatever you're trying to achieve. It's not about, it's not about money. But you all have to be results obsessed as well. Willow Creek did not get built by people going, Bill didn't say, gee, this is pretty fun and I hope we get a lot of people here. He said, we will measure our success by the souls we save and the people we attract. He is relentlessly results focused. The results just happen to be the most important thing there is. So people often think, well, that's only money that's the bottom line. The bottom line is whatever you measure success as. Okay. Okay, we've gone through the five dysfunctions of a team. And now what I'd like everybody to do, both here in South Barrington and out there around the uh, continent, if you will, is I'd like you to turn to page 28. Am I right, 28? Is that the assessment? I'd like you to take three minutes, 15 questions, to fill that out, and then to tabulate the results on the next page over. And then we're going to come back and kind of survey the audience here, and I'd like those in the, in the far-flung regions to do that as well, and we're going to talk about how to overcome these. Now, I'm going to have to limit my uh, survey here to South Barrington. My apologies to everybody around the, around the country and in Canada. Um, so I'd like to show of hands, how many people here found in the scoring that their, that their biggest challenge or dysfunction might be tr related to trust? Okay. Of course... It's probably more than that because you're not comfortable being vulnerable by raising your hand in front of everybody. <laughs> um, here's an exercise I want to give you. Now, every time I say this to a, to a group of executives, I think, oh, they're going to say, Pat, we've already done that. And I'm guessing the same thing here that you're going to... Now, they never have, it's interesting, but I think you guys may have. And this is something... That, and I don't know how many people here have read Bill's book. I'm assuming all of you have, but I have, and it's, it's, it's great. It's fabulous. For, as, as a non-church leader, I found it terrific. And as a church leader, I would think it would be mandatory. I think it's awesome. He talks about an exercise called the hot seat exercise. And it's similar to what I'm going to talk to you about now. I call it personal histories. And, and to get a group of executives to do this is not always easy. Um, 
But what you do is you just go around. This, this takes 15 to 20 minutes. Now, the, the hot seat is longer than that and better. But when you've got a group of people that's a little bit reluctant, sometimes say, do, humor me for 20 minutes here. Humor me for 20 minutes. And we'll go around the table and I'll say, I just want to hear where you grew up, how many kids were in your family, and where you fell in that order, and what was the most interesting challenge of your childhood? Not your inner childhood, but of being a kid. You know, your youth. And so people, and, and, the, and the grumpiest one about it usually is the one that takes the longest because they're like, oh, finally I get to talk about this. And they just talk about it and where they grew up. And you find you have this amazing diversity of experience on your team that day in and day out while you're working, you might not know that. Now, I will have to say, I got to think churches are better at this than most companies. Because you're dealing with people and their lives, so it's hard not to. But even still, you'll do it and people will go, I didn't know that about you. I once worked with an executive team and the, the chief operating officer, this woman, she was frosty, is the best word I can use to describe her. <laughs> but she was really frosty. And I was a consultant to the, to the company and, and I thought she hated me. But I was glad to find out that she actually hated everyone. <laughs> you know, I was glad, you know, I was good. But anyway, so we did this exercise. She did not want to do this exercise. And so we did it, and she said, yeah, I was born in, Ger I was raised in Germany. My father was a general in the, in the armed forces, so we, I was raised overseas. I was an only child. I was a prima ballerina, and uh, whenever I succeeded at that, he usually knocked me down a couple pegs because he didn't want me to get a big head. And, you know, we're all sitting there going, oh, that's why. You know, you know, you know the prayer of St. Francis, you know, seek to understand, not to be understood? The more you can understand one another, the more you're going to avoid something called the fundamental attribution error. And I don't know if you know what that sounds very sophisticated, but it's not. The fundamental attribution error is that we tend to attribute other people's negative behaviors to their character, internal attribution, but our own to our environment, an external attribution. In other words, if I go to the grocery store and I see some dad with twin boys that are five and he's, he's swatting one of them or scolding one particularly harshly, I think, that, that's a mean, angry man. The next day I'm doing it, I'm like, I've got some unruly children. <laughs> You know, it's my environment that's making me do it, but he must be, have a problem. The more we understand about people's lives and backgrounds and histories, the more we will attribute it to their environment and seek to understand them. And the more we will be comfortable revealing things about ourselves. The Myers-Briggs is another tool, or, and I know there's a whole bunch of them. There's DISC, and I'm not a bigot about which one you use. I really like the Myers-Briggs. The whole purpose is this, give people a vocabulary for turning to one another and saying, I'm not good at these three things, and it says so right here, and it's true. It's safe. It's safe. I mean, like, I'm that ENFP, as you know. My staff will, in a meeting will go, focus, Pat, focus. And that's harder to do. They're like, you know that P? Turn it into a J, for those that know the Myers-Briggs. But now we have a vocabulary so they can say that, but it's harder for people to do that without that. So do the hot seat exercise. Do the personal histories exercise and slowly get people to open up and be vulnerable about who they are. It will improve the trust level on the team. It's not touchy-feely. It's not silly. It's applied, and it doesn't have to take very long. Okay, how many people said they struggle in their organizations with conflict? Show of hands, show of hands. Yeah, yeah, I would think that that would be fairly common. Here's a little... Here's a little kernel of wisdom. And by the way, you cannot afford not to have conflict in your organizations. The stakes that you're dealing with are so high to go to a meeting and debate the merits of an outreach program or a school program or your ministry and not passionately disagree when it needs to happen is such a shame. And as much as we might think that we're being Christian by not making someone uncomfortable in talking about an issue, Loving them enough to disagree passionately about the issue so that we don't ultimately have negative conflict and we make our ministries better, is tr I, think, I think is completely consistent with our faith. We cannot afford not to have good, healthy conflict. The kind that you come back from and makes your marriage better or your family better or your company better or your church better. Okay? And here's a little exercise. So if, you, if conflict is your issue, I think you should go and say so and say, you know, I think it's hard, and it's probably me as a leader that makes it so, and I know it's hard, and I want us to start having more conflict. <laughs> and, oh, and right away it'll change, believe me. <laughs> Here's what I think you need to do, though. The first time someone disagrees at a meeting, do something that's completely counterintuitive. Interrupt the disagreement. And so I do this all the time with executive teams, and I'm like, hey, wait a second, you know what you're doing right now? You're, you're disagreeing, they're like, yeah. I'm like, this is really good. 
And these are like Fortune 500 executives. I think they're, well, thanks, Pat. And they're like, oh, okay, good. And then they dive back in and they drain away all the anxiety they're feeling. But in, I call it real-time permission. Give them real-time permission to engage in conflict. And also, here's another piece of advice. Be a miner of conflict. M-I-N-E-R, not O-R. Be a miner of conflict. Mine for conflict at your meetings. When you're, when you're at a meeting and you know that there's an issue that people aren't in agreement but they're not going there, you be the one to go, whoa, whoa, wait a second. I think you two don't agree, do you? <laughs> you know? Sounds like you're a pot stirrer, but you're not. You're actually putting the issues on the table. Every time I've done that in an executive meeting for my clients, they come up to me after, I'm so glad you made us talk about that because it's just sitting there. The only thing worse than talking about that issue is not talking about it. And as Jim Collins, I think it was Jim who said, I've seen a lot of speeches this week, so I can't remember who said it. In fact, it might have been Bill. The issue's already there. You know, the pain exists anyway. Put it out there on the table and wrestle with it and deal with it. Conflict is critical. It's hard. Okay, how many people here said their team struggle with Commitment, people not actually committing to things, it's tepid and it's, of course this is related, yeah I see some hands, this is related to conflict as well. Here's a, here's a tip I would give you, at the end of every meeting you have, with five minutes to go when everybody's like, okay can I leave now and get back to my office and do some real work, that's what people are thinking, <laughs> say no, we have five minutes to go, we are going to agree on what we've just agreed on. And so go to the whiteboard and write down, I think this is what we've agreed on, and by seeing it written down, when people don't agree, they're gonna go, okay, I, I, I don't agree with that. Because the other thing you're gonna do is ask them after you've agreed on what you've agreed on, they have to go tell their teams within 24 hours. We call this commitment and cascading communication. And we've seen sophisticated companies with email and voicemail and broadcast satellite and everything else. We've seen this communication mechanism transform the entire company. At the end of the meeting, the executives say, okay, I think we just agreed on these three things. Speak now or forever hold your peace. And now everybody has to go out and tell their staffs within 24 hours. Employees are, go crazy. They're like, oh my gosh, these people are communicating consistently? What is wrong around here? <laughs> so take five minutes at the end of those staff meetings, and it's a painful five minutes at first, to say, what did we just agree on? And you'll be amazed at how many times you thought, I didn't agree to that. And then go out and communicate it to just the next level in 24 hours. And then cascade it down from there. It's crazy how powerful it is. You know what the best kind of, the most effective communication in any organization is, right? It's rumors. <laughs> right? I mean, so just tell true rumors. Leave the meeting and go, hey, everybody go tell all your people that we're going to do this. It's crazy. It'll spread like, it's true. How many people here said they struggle with accountability? People don't like to hold each other accountable? Yeah. My wife, who's here, I'm so happy she's here, she, um, she took me to an improv class years ago. You know, and uh, she was she's an actress, and she um, and boy, the actors are awesome in these skits, aren't they? Yeah. I know what you're thinking. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> the talent here is just astounding. It's amazing. Anyway, where's that guy? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, the, the the improv class. Thanks. I wish I were joking about that. I I just forget sometimes. Um, <laughs> So she took me to an improv class, and one of the things I learned in improv is this. See, when, when people are doing an improv skit and somebody says something really wacky and uncomfortable, the natural inclination of people is to go, ooh, that's weird, I'm gonna wait for somebody to say something I can work with. And yet the best improv comes from people entering the danger. Somebody says something weird and you go, all right, let's talk about that. And that's how we have to be as leaders. We have to enter the danger when we see an issue with a person and we're like, ooh, I want to steer clear of that. That's the one you have to walk right into and go, we better talk about that. Because I think that's going to cause a problem for you. Be the kind of leader who enters the danger in your churches. It is liberating. Not for yourself only, but for the people who are with you. They will be so glad. They will be so glad. Now, I told you before that my temptation as a leader and my dysfunction on our team as a result, and it's my fault, is this one. So here's the advice I give you also. Tell your staff that you're bad at this. <laughs> Say, I don't like to hold people accountable. It's a weakness of mine, so I might hold back or water it down, and then it's going to come back to bite you later. So just know, I'm, I'm trying, 
but help me in any way you can. Because I have a staff member who, when I give her a performance review, and I love to give positive feedback. I told her all the wonderful things she does, and then I got to the end and said, now there's a couple things that I think you could do better at, but you know, I might be wrong about it. And maybe you should, and she said, Pat, stop. I know you're bad, this is temptation number two. Tell me what I'm bad at. It's the temptation to go in the other order. Tell me what I'm bad at, because if you don't, it's, it's gonna hurt me anyway. And I'm like, you're right. So let people know I'm not good at this, because your people know it serves them for you to be clear with them. That doesn't give you permission to stop trying. It just, they're gonna help you. They're gonna help you. The other thing is this. Realize that when you fail to hold someone accountable and enter the danger and call them on something or talk to them about something, do not let yourself be under the false assumption that you're doing it for their own good. I used to do that, like, oh, I just don't want them to feel bad. No, really what it was is, I don't wanna feel bad. Or better yet, I don't wanna be around when they feel bad. <laughs> Holding back difficult information for a person on your team is ultimately a selfish act. And I think when we realize that, we'll have the courage to do it. But when we can hide behind the, well, I care about them and I don't want them to be uncomfortable, that's deluding ourselves. Okay. Final point. How many people here said that focus on results versus status? Your teams are status focused. Not so many. Few, few. Make your goals public and make them real. Remember when Bill said 80 million? Don't say many millions. And if we get to 70, that'll be good. You gotta say, this is the goal. If it's 75, we failed. Don't let yourself, and in a, in a field like yours, people, where you're saving people's souls, I know quantifying a goal seems crazy. Because what you're doing is sometimes difficult to quantify. That's why you have to inject in your organization a results focus. Quantify it as much as you can. And then hold people accountable to that. And if you can, build trust in your organization through vulnerability. And thereby allow people to engage in conflict with one another around issues. And thereby make it easier for them to actually commit to those issues so that they'll hold each other accountable. The results just come. And suddenly the place is full, souls are being saved, and you sleep really well at night. Thank you for having me here. God bless you all.